Good morning, everyone. It's so great to see all of you here today. My name is Lisa Arias. I'm a Scoville Fellow at CSIS, and I will be moderating this wonderful panel this morning. Before we get started, I do want to take a moment to thank Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, Brookings Institution, and WCAPS for putting together this phenomenal event. The last panel we heard from had a wonderful discussion and we've had wonderful insights all morning and we're going to continue that trend here today. Um, we're gonna take a much more broader focus than the previous panel did. The previous panel focused on regional issues. We're going to be focused specifically on issues within the national security spectrum and we have a wonderful panel to do that. So I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves and then we'll jump right in and leave enough time for audience questions. I am Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley. I am a retired uh, U.S. diplomat, former ambassador to Malta, former deputy assistant secretary for counterterrorism. Um, and I am here with my third way cyber enforcement initiative hat. Uh, I'm Mohammed Fraser Rahim, the executive director for Quilliam um, International. Um, I run our efforts in North America. Uh, we are the world's oldest counter-extremism organization. We work on rehabilitation more broadly, uh, former extremism or extremists. Um, I'm also an assistant professor at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Azra Zaya, and I am the president and CEO of the Alliance for Peacebuilding. We are the largest global network of peacebuilding organizations worldwide, 100 plus members working in 153 countries to sustain peace and end conflict. I'm also a uh, recovering former diplomat. <laughs> Good morning, uh, my name is Daniel Lucy, uh, and I'd like to thank Ambassador Jenkins and the Brookings Institution for allowing me to participate in the panel today. I'm an infectious disease and public health physician. Um, uh, I. Uh, teach at Georgetown uh, Medical Center and also at the uh, New Institute, uh, the Law Center. Um, uh, in addition, I'm a research associate in anthropology at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, where uh, we helped to create a three-year exhibit on epidemics, uh, which is largely what my career has, has focused on. Uh, and it's open from 2018 until 2001, 2021. Thank you. Great, well as you can see, we have ample expertise to draw from. The first question I'd like to pose to the panel has two parts. Each of you work on a wide ranging number of issues from cybersecurity to counterterrorism, peace building and global health. I'd be curious to hear whether you believe that your specific issue area has been impacted by the policies or perhaps I should say the absence of policies um, enacted since 2016, and what you believe the long-term implications of those policies are for the field. The second part is given that we live in a society where the electoral environment creates shifts from one side to the other every four to eight years, what do you think the long-term effects of that are for long-term American national security? So why don't we start with you, Ambassador Wynne Stanley? Um, certainly. Uh, there has been a marked difference with how this administration deals with cybersecurity and the role of the United States in international fora. Um, the cyber czar from the Department of State position has not been filled again. It was a very important coordinating position for U.S. government agencies and how we interacted with other governments overseas. Uh, by the U.S. retrenching in our position of leadership on this very important issue, it means that we are not having the influence, we are not gathering our allies in international fora, particularly in the United Nations, with ensuring that our priorities and views are uh, supported and take precedence over some very different views, competing views, from Russia and China and other countries throughout the world. So our lack of leadership is in fact going to harm us, in my opinion, in the longer term. Um, the second part of your question is 
repeat it, please? Sorry. Sure. So given that we live in an electoral system where you often see a shift from one party to another every four to eight years, and mm -hmm. as a result, we often see very different policies being put forth, what you think the long-term implications of that are for American national security? Right. Okay, thank you. Then I would argue that, that those shifts, such as they are, and, and certainly as a diplomat, we always argued that the shifts overseas were not as large as people expected them to be from one administration to the other. A lot of wasted time, a lot of missed opportunities for what we as the United States can accomplish internationally. And, and we need to show leadership on a number of issues. And when we step back, it falters. So I'd say we're missing opportunities and we've wasted time. Um, so I didn't mention this, but I, I worked in the intelligence community. I worked at, I was a counterterrorism analyst, and Gina and I worked together um, on, I was thinking about the Cairo speech too as yeah. well. Um, and I worked at our National Counterterrorism Center. And so, you know, I'm thinking about how things have shifted. I mean, just in terms of terminology. For the work that I do, I'm dealing with violent extremism more broadly, counterterrorism, the distinction that CVE is not necessarily within the same counterterrorism rubric. Um, as a government analyst, I probably thought they were one in the same. And so I think for me, I, the, it's been an interesting shift from seeing a very government-centric sort of understanding of the problem set and then being on the outside working in the nonprofit space where we are working in real time on issues of de-radicalization, uh, demobilization, and rehabilitation, both domestically in the United States and certainly abroad. And so uh, we're now getting into the nuanced nature and what do we mean when we talk about extremism? What do we mean when we talk about terrorism? What do we mean when are we making the distinction between academics when I'm teaching my students and cadets who will be going into the military? Um, how, are we talking about political violence? And so all that definitional sort of nuanced nature, nature is so important to where we are going. Um, we, I know that there were certainly uh, conversations, particularly early on, whether the Trump administration language of um, and the use are, is this countering Islamist or countering Islamic extremism? What do we mean by that? Is it uh, terrorism prevention? Um, one positive thing I can say within the Trump administration is that they haven't used that language, um, at least per se, in outward fashion. There might be certainly some other criticism on, on their nuanced nature of it. But I think for me, it's been, a, for our work, this is important. Um, the, the language, the labeling, we know, and this probably will get to some of the points we'll get into later, but we know that there's just a rise of just extremism more broadly, particularly in the domestic terrorism space. Um, as it relates to the second question, um, yes, I think that there are shifts. Um, the, in a perfect world, there is a continuity of information and briefing from one, gener from one previous administration to the next. We certainly saw some of the breakdown of that between the Obama administration and also the uh, Trump administration um, doing a content analysis of the national security strategy that was put out, um, or counterterrorism strategy was put out back in November. Um, I would have liked to see a little bit more meat um, to the table as it relates to prevention. Um, the jury is still out where we're actually going at on this issue. And so um, I think uh, we have wasted time and light of the problem set and the issues that are increasing. Um, and that is a concern, at least from a, someone who's working on counter extremism a, on a daily basis. So Dr. Rahim, you talked about prevention and I know that Ezra works on peace building, which to my understanding seeks to address the root causes of conflict. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this. No, absolutely. Uh, I'm an optimist by nature, so I'm going to take a, a, a bit more of a hopeful look forward in terms of uh, what the changes since 2017 have wrought in our field. Uh, I would say that the indicators are all quite negative globally. You know, we are seeing unprecedented numbers in terms of global displacement, over 70 million civilians worldwide being pushed out of their homes, of their residences driven by conflict, driven by violence. Uh, we've also seen a shift in uh, humanitarian assistance worldwide, where 20 years ago, it was the more traditional frame, 80% of humanitarian assistance went towards natural disaster, recovery, and relief. Now that paradigm has shifted. 
80% of humanitarian relief goes towards conflict-driven violence and outcomes. Now, the answer, as you mentioned, uh, Lisa, is prevention. And what's interesting to me is we are seeing emerging, I think, a bipartisan consensus towards a paradigm shift of smart power, of a full spectrum effort of peace building, what I would call bringing in development, bringing in humanitarian relief, bringing in human rights advocacy, civil society support, capacity building, all towards smart preventive action that heads off conflict and resolves conflict. Conflict cannot be ended per se. It's healthy in any society to have divergences and differences that can hopefully lead to a better outcome. But we, I think, are facing a moment where maybe some of the complacency that experts like me and many of my fine colleagues who are still in government had that simply the facts would bring us to a better solution. I think we really now need to involve more actors. It isn't just government who can solve these problems. Civil society, many of the wonderful panelists who have presented today, I think are part of that effort, but also looking for like-minded partners, fellow governments, fellow actors um, in academia, in advocacy organizations who can work towards this preventive root causes approach. One final point I would make is, you know, despite the very disturbing or sobering message uh, sent by consecutive administrative budgets since 2017, again, we've seen a bipartisan consensus in Congress that has preserved State Department and USAID operations and assistance in these areas. So again, I think there is more there in terms of a constituency, irrespective of party, who believes in these smart investments towards our security and towards a more peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to focus on one specific uh, pivotal point where we are now, in my uh, opinion, between the previous administration, this administration, and then whatever the next administration is, with regard to um, international epidemics, which could originate in the United States or could uh, come to the United States. So the, uh, the point I'd like to focus on is called the Global Health Security Agenda, or GHSA, and it was begun in 2014, in February of 2014, uh, and funding uh, expires uh, September of this year. Hopefully, it'll, the funding will be, uh, adequate funding will uh, be renewed for the following four, uh, five years until 2024, and in my view, for five or 10 or 50 years, long after I'm gone after that, um, so the, the central focus of the global health security agenda begun in 2014 was on um, making the world safe against infectious diseases. So very um, ambitious um, uh, vision, I would say. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's a, uh, very important and, and it's had uh, clear progress over the past five years, but it's really a, a much longer than a five-year plan to really come to fruition, to, to maturation. Uh, to, to prevent epidemics, to respond better to them so they aren't as severe when they do occur. Uh, and I would say that um, also one thing that hasn't been emphasized enough is to uh, help with the recovery of the countries or the regions uh, uh, where the epidemics occurred. So the Global Health Security Agenda uh, focuses on three things, uh, to prevent, detect, and respond. Um, and there's 11 action packages, uh, which are divided up three or four each to the prevent, detect, and respond part. Uh, so prevent is, for example, uh, to prevent antimicrobial resistance, which really is a worldwide mm -hmm. ep uh, pandemic. It's worldwide epidemic, much like HIV uh, is, a, is truly a pandemic and tuberculosis, uh, which is linked with HIV. Um, but a second big point in the global health security agenda that I think is very important, looking back at all the epidemics for the last 50 years and going forward for for the next 10, 20, 50 years, uh, are infectious diseases, uh, viruses or bacteria or fungi that come from animals into our species. And most of the big outbreaks that uh, have reached the news uh, in the past uh, 15, 20 years are from animals, so we call them zoonotic. Uh, so Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is not just in the Middle East, but was in South Korea. 
in the summer, May, June of 2015. Uh, certainly Ebola in West Africa, now in the, the DRC, uh, in North Kivu and Turi province. Um, the SARS pneumonia in Asia and Toronto in 2003. Uh, all examples um, of these zoonotic diseases. Um, so the global health security agenda <coughs> now has expanded from 28 countries in 2014 to 64 countries, but also it's closely linked to building uh, the capacity to prevent and detect and respond epidemics in uh, not only these countries, but then <clears throat> through using a tool called the Joint External Evaluation, or JEE, working directly with the World Health Organization, and therefore <clears throat> not just 64 countries, but all countries in the world, to prevent, detect, and respond effectively. And I would say maybe some more emphasis needs to be added on the recovery part. So I'd like to follow up with you on that. It seems that prevention is a big part of the work you do, but it's often hard for us as a society to focus on prevention because we don't sense the urgency. And so I'm wondering if you see that there is adequate concern with a potential infectious disease epidemic in the near future. Do you think we're adequately preparing for that? And if not, how do we create a sense of urgency for something that hasn't happened yet? So I should have said in the beginning, anything I have to say is simply my own opinion. Uh, I, and I have some more uh, unorthodox opinions, so I'll, but I'll try to keep them uh, non-controversial and brief. Uh, so every day I wake up and I try to answer the question that you ask. And for me, it's not just about one threat, uh, epidemic. There's multiple ones. Nature doesn't uh, uh, re require that it behaves the way that we want it to or that you know, there's one epidemic at a time. There are epidemics going on all the time around the world. They're just not in the news anymore. There's, there's dengue, there's malaria, there's HIV, there's tuberculosis. There's just so many epidemics going on all the time. <clears throat> so, but I certainly agree with you uh, uh, about uh, for, if you really um, are successful in public health in preventing outbreaks, it's crickets. You hear nothing. You, and you get no benefit or no, n no added funding, et cetera. So <clears throat> I think uh, prevention to prevent something occurring or coming back that we should have been able to prevent, uh, we fail at that badly. And I'm speaking only for myself. Uh, but for example, the, the severe acute respiratory syndrome pneumonia that occurred in 2003, November 2002, coming out of Guangdong province in Southeast China, <clears throat> and then from Hong Kong going to many places, including Toronto, not just in Asia. Uh, it was a new class of a virus that never caused a severe human disease before, but now it turns out to be the same one as the Middle East respiratory syndrome, which appeared, <clears throat> everyone says, first in Saudi Arabia, but really it was in northern Jordan, in, in Zarqa, Jordan, in April of 2012. And now it spread at least once to uh, far away, to South Korea, far from the Middle East, as did the SARS virus. But we have no antiviral drugs and no vaccines for either of these two types of viruses, which are called coronaviruses. I'm just saying that as one example. And one other brief example, I'm breaking my promise to be brief, but uh, Ebola. So for me, um, I was very, very fortunate and honored one of the most meaningful uh, opportunities in my life as a physician is to be able to work in South Africa, taking care of providing care as best we could uh, in, in, in 2014 in Sierra Leone and, and then in Liberia with Doctors Without Borders in Liberia. Um, and now there's the 10th outbreak in the, in the DRC for the first time ever in a, a extremely uh, dangerous uh, and lethal uh, conflict zone, chronically lethal uh, conflict zone. Um, and you know, after 2001, uh, Ebola was uh, included in the list of the six uh, highest bio threats of the US government. They said uh, category A threats. Ebola was one of them. But where was the antiviral drug or drugs? Where was the antibodies against, uh, for treatment against Ebola? Where was the vaccine or vaccines against Ebola? Because we actually need more than one uh, for different, different species of Ebola. Um, where was the effective risk communication? All of which were glaringly absent in the uh, epidemic in, in 2014. It was glaringly absent with terrible consequences in terms of suffering and death of the people, including healthcare workers who, who suffered through the epidemic and, and now in DRC. Thank you for that. So as you all know, we're talking about interlinkages between domestic society and foreign policy. And I want to touch on that in my next question. We often hear that when voters go into the voting booth, they are primarily concerned with domestic policy and not so much foreign policy. But it is clear that there are linkages that exist between the two. And I'm wondering if 
any of you see direct links between the work you do and domestic society, and if you could talk a little bit about that, Ezra, I'm hoping you'd want to jump in here, um, talking about migration a little bit, especially when we saw the uh, cutting off of aid for the Northern Triangle, which was mentioned earlier, and what that might mean for uh, domestic migration policy. No, absolutely. Um, I, I maybe would like to share an anecdote actually from my past life as a diplomat where I was uh, the number two at the U.S. Embassy in Paris during a three-year period that was marked by a wave of terrorist attacks, three major terrorist attacks. I'm sure all of you recall, probably the most notorious was the November 13, 2015 attack that took 130 lives and multiple attacks all over the city. So as an American diplomat, I was charged with, you know, first mission, uh, assuring the safety and security of America, and we had a major undertaking to assist the victims, uh, the many American victims of this attack, but also um, engaging the host government, the French government, to offer American support and solidarity in addressing what was a largely domestic origin um, extremist, violent extremist problem with an intersection from the exploding conflict in Syria. Now, it seems like an entirely foreign policy issue, but what was interesting was at the same time, we had the uh, US uh, primaries in the United States. So one connection I would make is after the November 13 attacks of 2015, a few weeks later, then President, then candidate Trump uh, proposed the Muslim ban. And I myself, I have to say, having been overseas, I did see a direct connection between those two events. And I did see, you know, an instrumentalization, I would say, of foreign policy issues and crises for domestic purpose. Uh, on a more positive side, I think that the polarization um, that I witnessed in Europe, you know, driven by issues like the migrant crisis there, driven by uh, issues of inequality still lingering from the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, we now, I think, acknowledge that this polarization is occurring in our own country, and I think that creates an impetus towards action, positive action, to try to bridge these gaps. And that's where I, I feel strongly that the field of peace building is not only uh, a tool to use in managing conflict abroad, but it has an immediate relevance to the situation in our own country. So what we're talking about is applying principles of dialogue, of mediation, of getting over this you know, human instinct to put people in two categories, the us and the them, to really find a common thread that works towards solving problems together. So for me, you know, maybe more than ever, peace building has an immediate relevance at home and abroad. And, and one more point I would make just in answering your question on prevention and this nexus with public health. I mean, I do believe we have a strong evidence case for peace building in the national security space, saving lives and money. And I think all you have to do is look at the stats for the toll of American-led military intervention since 9-11, where there was a recent study by Brown University that put a price tag at $5.9 trillion in the cost of those wars if you factor in as well the care of the many American veterans who will need lifelong care as a result of their very um, courageous service. The civilian toll... Uh, all told is uh, the estimates are anywhere between 370 to 500 million. So, I mean, this is a absolute uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at peaceful means, peace building methods as an alternative to this $5.9 trillion cost, you see that only less than 1% of U.S. foreign assistance goes towards peace building. Now, studies have shown if you were to double that amount in the 31 most conflict-afflicted and fragile countries, you would have a cost savings over 10 years of nearly $3 trillion. 
So for me, you know, this is a case where it's not only nice to do, but it is the smart and really a must do. And, and I feel there's a moment of opportunity in reorienting, in redefining our national security policy at this moment towards prevention. Thank you. Does anybody else want to jump in here? Well, I'll, I'll say this, you know, we make this statement oftentimes that, you know, you don't have to be black to challenge racism. You don't have to be gay to challenge um, LGBTQ bias abuse, or you don't have to be Muslim to speak up against anti-Muslim bigotry. Um, but all those issues are shared issues that, particularly in a domestic context, communities must find a way to balance out in a cohesive manner to not just look at their singular issue, but work in a partnership fashion to realize this is a coalition effort. This must be done across our, in this case, a Western liberal democracy. So for us, this is important because we've been working tirelessly. Our organization was established by former extremists who were in the uh, who were on the other side of the of sort of the pendulum swing, involved in being former members of Al-Qaeda, former members of ISIS, former members of Hezbollah Tahrir, and they made this slow journey in and out of extremism. And they will tell you, including individuals we're working with right here in the United States, is that that journey takes time. But that journey that takes time also requires them to know the other. And knowing the other allows for a two-way conversation that at times might challenge some of their really deep-seated biases and prejudices, et cetera. And so um, for us, I think that that's important, particularly as we find ways to you know, address some of these domestic issues that certainly have a foreign policy agenda or foreign policy implications as well. Certainly the Muslim ban has been a concern too as well. And I think for us, it's, it's a constant, uh, it's a challenge, to be just quite honest with you. This isn't solved overnight. I, I was a former peace builder after I left government, working from the war room to the peace room, and then now, and I guess I'm in the outside world. Um, but, but, you know, and so, but those practices in peace building and reconciliation, conflict resolution are so vital and important. Um, and that sort of whole of society approach, if I say nothing um, else throughout this sort of dialogue with, with, with the panel is that that, 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 that communications, that, that, that sharing of, of, of knowledge is so important, and it's a whole of society approach. Um, and so that's a positive aspect. I think we, we certainly can see that that's something that we are engaging on, um, but I think there's more work that has to be done. Yeah. What's the term? Intersectionality? Intersectionality. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, certainly with, with cyber, and frankly, the frame of this entire discussion, redefining national security, all of these issues are national security issues. I mean, international issues with uh, domestic uh, implications. And cyber, like all the rest of them, we have our domestic views on it, but none of them are addressed or resolved domestically. So our, our privacy, surveillance, uh, you know, cyber surveillance, how we spend our time on the internet, uh, who has access to our information, how it might affect our democracy, our democratic processes, outside inter interference in that, and domestic interference in that. They're, they're all connected. The means of doing it are the same regardless of whether they're criminals or foreign governments or terrorist organizations, that the means are the same. So the cyber policy, I think, is very much falling into that. How we deal with it, enforcement is a, is a huge issue. To stop people from taking advantage of us or, per, or committing crimes against us, it takes enforcement, the fact that something bad is going to happen to them. And the latest cyber strategy for the United States talks about um, our, our uh, outreach and our ability to overmatch other countries, other um, organizations, but we also have to be able to bring people to justice. And that's something that we currently lack. And this is something that the current Congress could be working on, the administration should be thinking about, and it will be before us for the foreseeable future. So that's something that we need to think about because it has a domestic implication, as well as with international cooperation because we can't solve it by ourselves. 
And I'll leave it with that. Great. Does anybody else have anything? Oh, I just have to correct the statement I made before. The, the toll from the uh, U.S.-led war since 9-11 is 376,000. And between that and 500,000, still quite high. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So as you can see, there are clearly interlinkages between the two. And it seems that from what all of you have mentioned, there is a net positive to prevention, to addressing these issues before they become crises. How do we as members of the national security community better communicate that to the American public? Because it seems to me that if these, all of what you have mentioned seems like it's something that we should mm -hmm. all be engaging in and be advocating for, communication seems to be missing. How do we fix that? I, I, certainly for the cyber, I think we are all beginning to better understand the implications, our vulnerabilities as a nation and as individuals within the nation. You know, they always joke about when they ask who's had their identity compromised that it's not, you know, if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen to you. And I dare say some people in this room will already have had the experience, myself included. So um, that's one part of it. We're beginning to understand it. We're beginning to understand how different organizations and companies use our information access our information. I, I had the extraordinary uh, experience of trying to buy something from Costco, I'll call them out, <laughs> online. And before I could use it, I got the message that my cookies had been disabled. And unless I allowed them to track me, I could not spend my money with them. <laughs> so the reminder of if you're not paying for it, you are the product. That's one part of it. So I think people are increasingly beginning to understand that, and we're moving in a way as a nation to demand that it be addressed. So we need to keep talking about it, keep calling out these things as they happen to make sure we all understand we, we are the product and we are vulnerable internationally and domestically. You know, I think for the issue of terrorism issues um, that this is, this, as we've been saying, I think it, this is a societal issue and challenge. Um, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, and the attacks in 2015, Dylan Roof and the perpetrator that killed nine innocent lives at Emanuel AME Church um, was carried out by a white supremacist. Um, Anhars Brevik in 2011 carried out this attack and started this sort of mass wave in uh, Fraser Glen. Um, Frazier Glenn Miller, a very well-known white supremacist, um, mentioned that this Anhars Breivik's sort of manifesto was sort of part of this global movement to do something for, in this case, um, white men and preserving of Aryan identity. Um, so, f you know, for us, I mean, for me and the work that we're doing, I think seeing that the challenges, the issues are cutting across communities. This isn't just a threat of individuals who seek to abuse the name of Islam and carry out attacks in the name of Al Qaeda or Daesh. Um, that it, the, the full gamut is really where we're all in a situation where we have to respond to. It's the same issue within gang communities or individuals engaged with gang activity. <laughs> we just saw, obviously, the the, the uh, hip hop American rapper Nipsey Hussle who was a victim of, again, the information is still out there, but p potentially a gang attack. That response is a community response, but these are multiple issues. And so, so, you know, how do you get communities involved? How do you get the American public involved? You recognize that there is not a singular issue, that we all collectively must stand up and work in partnership to know the other. Um, you might have suspicions, you might have concerns. How can we engage to break down those barriers? And so because there's a diversity of issues at play, that requires all of us to be informed. And I, I think that that sort of simple message is so important. I mean, the Amtrak statement of see something, say something, it's a bit corny and cliche-ish, but it certainly resonates with us. So we have to find and come up with maybe some interesting newer mantras or mnemonic devices that might be attractive, at least in sort of the terrorism space or counterterrorism space to respond adequately for the broader layman, the public at large, to understand. So I'm curious because right now what we're seeing is that 
there is some reticence within certain government circles to acknowledge domestic terrorism. And I'm wondering who is going to lead that charge then? Is it up to civil society? Is it up to NGOs to engage with that? Who is at the forefront? I feel mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, it behooves all of us. So civil society certainly is going to have to speak up. Individuals are certainly going to have to speak up. But I think it remains a government responsibility because the government can marshal the resources of multiple agencies to address this. So we're not in the right space right now as a government, but we've got to get back there. We have to get back there. And we, again, you know, internationally, the fellow in uh, Australia, from Australia in New Zealand, who references Andres mm -hmm. Brevik. I mean, it is connected. We're using cyber to get that information out there. So all of these issues are, are absolutely interconnected. But I think it's going to take government. Uh, just to add a few points on the great uh, insights already shared, I would fully agree. I think it starts at the individual and community level. Uh, a friend of mine reminded me the other day, democracy is not a spectator sport. Mm -hmm. So um, to Arsalan's points made at the opening, I think so much of uh, mistrust or fear in society results from an other that you don't know or you think you don't know. So maybe all of us getting beyond our mm -hmm. comfort circle, our like-minded uh, dialogue partners to really take in those who seem so diametrically opposed and, and try to find common ground. Uh, you mentioned communication, which I believe is, is a major deficit on conveying this great evidence case. You've got, we've got to be, we as peace building organizations have to do a better job communicating the human element of, of all of this. Uh, toward that end, we recently launched with 17 other major peace building organizations something called the Coalition Campaign, which is now branded Plus Peace. You can look it up online and join us. And, and what it is, is a, it's an effort to, to drive from the grassroots uh, public embrace of all of the things we're discussing, peaceful, nonviolent means to address and bridge these differences. But again, I'm a firm believer that you know, it begins at the human level. I think we also have to look at the institutional level. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Abrahimi mentioned, there is a lot of uh, institutional damage that has been done to some of our major national security uh, organs, namely the State Department, where vacancies, you've had a major uh, exodus of senior leadership. We also have a less diverse and inclusive State Department. I would say the numbers show that. And, uh, just a little data point to share. Uh, the situation was not great at the end of the previous administration, but for African Americans in the senior foreign service, I believe we're at a crisis point. Mm -hmm. The numbers have gone down since late 2016 from 4.6% uh, to 3.0%. That is a major drop that I think needs to be addressed. And Again, the evidence case is proven that more diverse institutions and organizations produce better results. Thank you. Dr. Lucy, how do we make the case to the American public that global health matters? Through a collaborative, comprehensive, and persistent effort. And I think uh, the most important point is to know your audience and how best to communicate with your particular audience at a particular time. Um, the communication is, the, the effective, effective communication, I prefer to say, uh, um, is the central goal of the Smithsonian exhibit at the Museum of Natural History about epidemics. Um, and the, uh, in addition, there's a international and national uh, traveling version that it can be downloaded and has been and displayed in more than 30 countries in the past 11 months since the exhibit opened um, and more than 30 places in the United States and it continues to to spread. It's been translated into six languages uh, and it's available to be um, what I call customized or you, so any, in, any individual or organization whether in this country or any country around the world can add can create their own panels or posters to the international exhibit. And that, I think, is the most important part 
in terms of effective communication. And again, beyond, um, for, for any given uh, epidemic or virus or bacteria, um, you have to calibrate or uh, to effectively communicate, you have to make the message clear and understandable and embraceable for the community that you're uh, trying to convey the message with. And so, for example, on good epidemics, I, I always try to go to more than one country or more than one place where the epidemics are. So for SARS in 2003, I went to Guangzhou and Hong Kong and Toronto and, and, and Ebola, as I mentioned, Sierra Leone and Liberia, and then briefly to Guinea, um, MERS throughout the Middle East, and then to South Korea, uh, because it's, uh, the message is different uh, in terms of um, uh, who, who you're trying to effectively communicate with. So for me, the small step for the uh, uh, exhibit, which I originally proposed just before going to Sierra Leone in August of 2014, but which uh, is really a synergy of strengths that made it come true. So it's uh, curators and uh, an anthropologists, uh, visual designers, educational experts, writers, uh, many people from WHO, CDC, NIH, et cetera. Um, but I would say my own opinion is the, the major goal that I had in mind is to try to, to reduce the level of fear, especially excessive and irrational fear about epidemics that I think most of the general public in our country have, um, and to increase the level of hope. In other words, what can I do personally living in this city or another city in this country or in another country in the world? What can I do to help protect myself and help to educate other people about what they can do to prevent and respond to epidemics? Thank you. So I'm going to try and sneak in one last question. Not everybody needs to feel compelled to answer, and then we'll turn to audience questions. When we talk about national security, I think often, especially in today's environment, it's very easy to get caught up in partisanship. But at the end of the day, when we talk about national security, we are talking about our collective security as a country. WCAPS has done a lot of work on this theme um, of redefining national security. And I'm curious whether each of you feel that there is a need to redefine national security to better reflect our current needs and priorities, and if so, in what way? Who would like to start us off? I'll do a quick yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and this ability to have these conversations on an ongoing basis, I think, are really important for all of us in the country, so I'm hoping we have discussions like this around the country to talk about these issues. And that fact that when we're talking about national security, it is not a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. It's not a partisan issue. And over the years, we started doing national security strategies in 1988, and there have been consistencies through those strategies every year since then. I would argue they don't have the right things in them at this point, at this point in our history, uh, and that we need a wider diversity of people at the table to ensure that these sorts of issues are included in it in a, as priorities, and that the more diverse people you have bringing issues to the table, the better we're going to do at addressing them. So nonpartisan, yes, redefine it. Ditto, ditto, ditto. <laughs> uh, what I would just amplify um, is that you know the diversity of thinking, diversity of perspectives is so important. Um, I'm just thinking about my time being in government and being at the table um, and offering insights. I'm thinking about projects we worked on together. Mm -hmm. Just being able to provide really practical, um, hey, we're going to go this direction, but maybe you need to not work on this because it's going to have a tone deaf response. Um, so I think that those having that diversity of viewpoints is enriching diversity of uh, you know experiences. Um, our unity is our diversity. We, we say that, but I think really um, our diaspora communities, our individuals coming from elsewhere, really help shape how our how we can respond to global issues and respond in an adequate and timely way. Again, ditto, ditto. <laughs> uh, two quick points I would make. Uh, again, I believe that we should redefine national security towards embracing prevention yeah. as a frame. But two, I absolutely second uh, the emphasis on 
inclusion, but I think you can take it at so many different levels. And one I would say, having been at the table in American-led deliberations, is we need local voices at the table. You know, you take a case in point, Afghanistan, where you have both uh, the democratically elected government, but more importantly, Afghan women absent mm -hmm. from a process for which, um, again, the evidence is established then when women in civil society participate in negotiations, peace agreements are 64% more likely to last. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's a must do in addition to being a nice to do. But I think we can take that inclusion question you know, self-critically in terms of our own country and getting out of the, the DC bubble mm -hmm. to really make these issues relevant and make the connection to Americans of all backgrounds, irrespective of rural, urban, party affiliation, or religion. And, and I'm a big believer in that. Thank you. Any final uh, thoughts? I won't say did I would say yes, yes, and yes. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Diversity of lexicon. Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I think with the infectious disease, from my point of view, I'm obviously biased. I, I think there's not a very difficult case to make. <laughs> We always say, oh, virus, I should use a different lexicon, but you know, viruses don't respect borders well, neither do bacteria, <laughs> parasites, and malaria, anything else. Um, but again, I, if I can just say this, I think that once again, we're at a pivotal time, much like I said before with global health security agenda, whether it's going to be refunded for the next five years or not, that's going to be decided in a couple months. Um, the pivotal time that I would call attention to now, and again, it's strictly my opinion, um, is that the new, as of September 18th, 2018, the, so I call it new, uh, U.S. Mm, National Biodefense Strategy was first announced, if you will, September 18th and, 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 and uh, out, out of the Oval Office. And, and um, the Secretary of HHS was named as the cabinet level, as it, so it's a cabinet level, level um, um, authority organization, and, and the Secretary of HHS uh, was designated as the head uh, for organizing the U.S. biodefense um, national strategy. Um, and uh, under the secretary is a, a medical doctor who's the assistant secretary for preparedness and response, or ASPR, ESPR, and it's Dr. Robert Cadlick. Um, and he um, uh, is quite familiar with epidemics from around the world, uh, with the zoonosis, so-called One Health, with, which integrates human health and animal health and environmental health. Um, and they're having a meeting two weeks from now here in D.C. to try to get um, national input, and I hope international input, but certainly national input to our new biodefense strategy. And he spoke last night, Dr. Cadillac did, at a meeting at EcoHealth Alliance, which uh, is a big champion of, of international work to prevent, detect, and respond to zoonotic uh, epidemics. And also they emphasized recover as well in their new um, document from this past month. Uh, in order it's building uh, resilience against bio threats. And so I'd uh, just like to say that uh, I think Dr. Cadillac is, is a good person to be in charge, if you will, of the uh, of HHS ASPR office, um, because while the primary focus is understandably on the U.S., he's quite aware of viruses coming from elsewhere, bacteria, bi biological um, threats. Great, thank you so much. We have about 15 minutes left for questions. So I will take about four to five and then I will turn to the panelists to respond to the question or questions that they would like. So why don't we go right over here, the gentleman in the back. Please state your name and affiliation. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Leo Cruz with National Security Action and thank you for the discussion this morning. Uh, to talk about the diversity of issues that you all represent, uh, what is the bold vision for looking ahead and what are the tools that you need to reimagine what we have in our national security toolbox? Thinking about that, how do we communicate that value to the American people, particularly when there is an information campaign uh, and even talking about you know disinformation when it comes to vaccines, when it uh, comes into democracy, when it comes into diplomacy, all these issues are intersectional. Uh, even the truth is about climate change, this distraction that we're fighting, how can we combat it and live up to our values and change the way we, we interact with the world, but then also how do we sell that at home, that this is a valuable thing that we need to engage in? 
Thank you. Great, thank you. We'll go to the lady right here in the back. Hi, Abby Gunner, um, student at SAIS and also program assistant with women in international security. Um, so we're talking a lot about the Green New Deal domestically, but in terms of climate change on, um, and its relation to uh, conflict and crisis and also global health uh, nas nationally and also globally, I'm wondering how we connect those, that issue to uh, national security issues. Great, thank you. Right here? The gentleman right. Yep. Thank you. Um, this question is for Dr. Muhammad. Um, you previously mentioned in your remarks about the rising white supremacist violence internationally, but also right here in the United States. Uh, I'd be curious, since you have a background in CVE, um, how would you apply that kind of CVE mindset to trying to resolve uh, the, that rising extremism here in the United States? Thank you. Do we have anyone else? Yes, right here. Good morning, Mithra, then a current high school student. So this question is for the ambassador. It's, it appears clear that cyber law has fallen behind cyber technology. And how do we really go about enforcement or preventative action, as the other panelists mentioned, regarding cyber threats? Great, thank you. One more, or can we turn to the panelists? Great, so thank you for those wide-ranging and insightful questions. Who would like to take the first one? I know Ambassador Wynn Stanley, we had one just addressed to you just now. Okay, so I'll start. Great question, thank you. I did not pay her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we have fallen behind, and the thoughts on what we need to do are in three categories that we as citizens need to be thinking about and demanding accountability for. One is our government, what we're doing. And the recent strategy that was put out, as I said, it talked about overmatch and possibly retaliation or response through cyber activities, cyber incidents. We have a number of ways of describing them. That certainly is a part of it. But again, the enforcement is also important. The ability to hold people to account, not just to attack them, but to bring them to justice. And so that is law enforcement, providing new tools and ensuring uh, cooperation among different aspects of U.S. agencies that deal with this issue. So holding our government to a higher standard, holding the private sector uh, to a higher standard, whether it is social media platforms and what they allow to happen to us via their platform at our expense, or companies, um, organizations that allow our privacy to be compromised. And the reality is we're the victims, they aren't the victims, and the cost of doing something, they've made a calculation, it's easier to tell us a few months later, oh, your information is out there and good luck with that. They also need to be held to account and to raise those standards. They can do a better job. And we as individuals also have to be held to account because we can do a better job. We have to demand and look at what the reality is and not decide that the convenience is more important than what is actually happening to us. And I think a long-term impact into influence and our democracy and how we conduct ourselves as a nation. So all three categories have things to do in this space, and I think we can. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to just take a stab at the, at the first question, which was a, a tough one, but you know, what I understood is you asked, how do you, given all the negative factor, factors we described, articulate a new vision or mm -hmm. that um, is truly a way forward? I, I absolutely believe uh, we can't you know, hope for the best or hope to go back to a status quo ante of, of 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, the world is moving and the retreat in American executive branch leadership that we're seeing, let's say in multilateral fora, or we talked about Africa policy and China's very, you know, firing on all cylinders, one belt, one road approach. So I, I really believe that the answer is through greater power sharing and inclusion. You know, I, I firmly believe the United States remains the preeminent power 
but it is not the sole superpower. And with that means some of the uh, traditional elements of shoring up alliances, which are, are greatly frayed at this very moment, but also looking at, you know, big emerging powers like India, like Brazil, despite the electoral you know, results there. South Africa, we don't hear much, but we <laughs> should be talking about. And um, getting beyond governments and really bringing in non-government stakeholders as not only as partners, but on, on more as as equal partners, I mean, with mutual respect and involving the private sector in that area as well. I mean, if anything is true, you know, in my own observation, you know, having come back to the US after three years living in Europe during a very difficult phase, this disaffection that we see with uh, institutions is global. Mm -hmm. But with that, I think becomes an exciting opportunity of how do we reconstruct those institutions to address monumental challenges like climate change, which I firmly believe is our greatest long-term national security threat, as well as the opportunity of technology transforming uh, the entire mode by which we receive information, communicate, and think. So, I think the, the onus is on all of us to articulate that new vision, but in a way that maybe we don't have to be uh, constrained by a post-1945 P5 US sole superpower, USG, I would say, approach. I would add just to, um, I agree, I think that this, we have to be creative, particularly in our US government space. I think the public-private partnership probably can, we can open up so many more doors in that domain. Um, you know, the incubator space, get as creative as possible. Um, we didn't even add into the AI dynamic to this, mm -hmm. which is a whole other oh, exactly. sort of element yeah. to this as well, and all of our spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I, I think that there, there's ways to be creative. There's a fascinating piece that came out, I think, yesterday in Quartz Africa mm -hmm. about what's taking place in Rwanda. Um, I have my issues and concerns with Kagame, but um, f that's a whole nother conversation. But mm -hmm. what I will say to you is the Germans, particularly Volkswagen, is there doing some creative work, particularly with ride sharing, um, really interesting entrepreneurial activity with innovation and creativity that I think we could learn from as well. Um, some practices of just uh, recycling, um, good government practices, again, not perfect, but elements in which we could extract to apply for our context as well. Um, as it relates to your question, uh, just for brevity and make sure every, everyone else is able to respond, um, we're already doing this. We're working, we're rehabilitating individuals as we speak right now um, in the United States. Um, so I, I, I'll give you that short version, which is positive. Um, we're working with other partners. We play nice in the sandbox. So, you know, in the non nonprofit space, we believe in if other people are doing good work, use those good practices as well. Um, there's an organization called Free Radicals that's done some really creative work. Uh, Christian uh, Pecciolini, you might be familiar with him, former neo-Nazi himself. Um, and so uh, their efforts are already in, in way both in the United States, in Europe where our headquarters is based, where we're doing work as we speak, um, and expanding too as well. Thank you. If I could just speak briefly to the two questions on this side, adding on to what Mohammed said, uh, I just want to uh, say just now and earlier, uh, the American gentleman that person that you mentioned had read the manifesto of the Norwegian gentleman. Mm -hmm. and there was a very small part that caught my attention, and that was that both the American and, uh, uh, and, and the Norwegian uh, mentioned three specific infectious diseases that they wish they could put their hands on to infect wow. people. One was the <laughs> pandemic influenza virus of 1918, which is the worst one that we've ever known of. And, um, yeah, and, and the second one was smallpox, which has been eradicated from the world uh, since 1980, but still exists in <coughs> laboratories in Atlanta CDC and in a place called Novosibirsk in Russia, um, and anthrax. Mm -hmm. so, uh, God forbid if, they, if that ever happens, any, any of those three. 
with regard to climate change, just from my uh, narrow lens of infectious disease, for me, it's really, uh, all, well, I'll just say it, it's, 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 um, it's 100% sure, I always hate to say that, and, but it's 100% sure that um, uh, due to climate change, the geographical range of where uh, we would call vectors, so mosquitoes and ticks and fleas, is going to expand mm -hmm. and be able to transmit their viruses and bacteria, you know, whether it's uh, you know, malaria or dengue or chikungunya or yellow fever or, or Zika or, or, or Lyme disease to many, many more parts of the world and many more uh, human beings and our, you know, our species that have not been exposed before and therefore don't have any population immunity. And also most of those diseases, with few exceptions like yellow fever, are, we don't have vaccines for or effective treatments for. That, that, that's, that, that's happening now and it will continue to happen. That's, that's 100%. Well, thank you all. Thank you everyone for coming today and joining in on this wonderful discussion. Please join me in thanking our panelists. If I could just have 30 seconds. Uh, Bonnie asked me to just say a farewell and a thank you. I'm not going to make any new additional intervention or speech, but I will simply observe that going back to the title of our event, Redefining National Security, even if you take a traditional definition and you want to stick with that, and Jung Pak was talking about traditional threats earlier, even if it's about threats to Americans and to the homeland, it's clear that the nature of the threats the types of threats are changing and evolving and multiplying, but also maybe the opportunities, the groups that can work together globally and at home to confront those threats present us with ways in which we can be more effective. So again, you don't have to necessarily walk away wanting to redefine the meaning of the words national security, but I hope that these panels have helped convey uh, the range of new dangers and perils, but also some of the positive opportunities that we have working together. So thank you all for being here and happy weekend. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.